All right, welcome. Uh, in my Bible, the one that I'm using, 890 pages in the Old Testament, 261 pages in the New, 1151, we've done 1,060. We're 91 pages from being through. Okay? Somebody told me you weren't going to live long enough to do Revelation. You're going to live long enough. Hang in there. We've, we've come a long way together here, and uh, we have about 90 pages to go. Today we're at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, I marked that we left off at verse 25. Does that sound right? Chapter 7, verse 25. If you're new with us, thank you so much for coming. We're really pleased that you've joined us today. We hope you will want to join our class every Sunday. See us through to the end of Revelation. I know that that particular book always draws a big crowd. So we'll be looking forward to that book uh, with great anticipation. We've got some other really good material before we get there, though. Uh, these, these other works we're going to be dealing with, though much shorter than, than so many of the books we've dealt with, certainly are not unimportant. They're very important. We'll be dealing with those uh, one by one, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. So thank you so much for coming. The scholar we're using on this particular book is Dr. Richard Hayes. He holds a distinguished chair in New Testament studies at Duke Divinity School. So, a very capable man, and he's the one who's written the commentary I'm using on this book. And then, of course, we'll move on to 2 Corinthians and, and on and on. So, thank you so much for coming. What I do is read for you, uh, try to cut down the volume of material, sort of try to do a Reader's Digest condensed version of one of these scholars. Uh, not uh, leaving out anything that I think is important for you or that you would want to know, need to know, in order to deal with any given book as intelligently and faithfully as we can. All right? Let's pray. God, we've spent years going through this book of yours, as you well know. And every Sunday we ask your help. Uh, we begin by thanking you for this book of yours that you could find people way back there a long time ago who would listen carefully to you with their hearts, who were certainly impeded by the time and place in which each one of them lived, and yet they were able to hear from you things that were forever true about you and about us. Those are the things we're looking for. So as we struggle along here with Paul's dealing with a specific group of people in a specific place, 2,000 years ago, help us find things that are forever true about people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and how we may faithfully live out our lives according to your will and purposes, which we've come to know most clearly in Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, everybody happy? Look at 1 Corinthians 7, verse 25. We're dealing with a section here, as you know, about sexual matters, and... <coughs> Paul seems to be addressing specific things that have been asked in a letter to him that's come from Corinth over to Ephesus, where he's writing, uh, from which he's writing. So, uh, just to remind you quickly here, um, here we have the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea. And then if you come all the way up from Israel into modern-day Lebanon, and then you would spill over on into Turkey, uh, Paul's birth at Tarsus, a Roman province, making him a Roman citizen. This whole territory uh, was Galatia. Maybe I should, I'm going to use this map to be a little more specific here. This star is Ephesus. Okay, and Paul's writing from Ephesus here. This is Athens, this is Corinth. And this would be uh, ancient Byzantium. Constantinople, Istanbul, and down here, uh, places Paul visited on the old Roman road called the Via Ignatia, uh, where later the railroad went through, hundreds of years later, of course, the uh, Orient Express. So you had Macedonia, was northernmost Greece called Macedonia, which produced Philip of Macedon, who was the father of Alexander the Great, and so on. So very historical places here. Um, uh, Philip the Great, of course, uh, about 400 years before Paul. But nonetheless, Thessalonica, Philippi, and so on. These places right along the Via Ignatia. Then Paul went south to Athens and over to Corinth. 
It's been about 18 months here, we know, and now has ended up back in Ephesus and is writing from there to Corinth. So he's received a letter, and they're asking him uh, what they should do, how they should approach various problems. And so he's dealt with folks married and folks not married and so on, and now he comes to a section about the virgins. So let's take a look here. Now, concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord. It uh, doesn't mean he's not going to give them an opinion, uh, but, but he has no command of the Lord about this. But I give my opinion as one who, by the Lord's mercy, is trustworthy. So even though God hasn't spoken to me directly, uh, you'll do well to pay attention to what I think. I think that in view of the impending crisis, it is well for you to remain as you are. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you do not sin. And if a virgin marries, she does not sin. Yet those who marry will experience distress in this life. You might want to put double star by that. (coughs) Those who marry will experience distress in this life. And I would spare you that. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. And that's the key to his whole discussion here. The appointed time has grown short. He thinks Jesus is coming back next week, next month for sure. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about the affairs of the world, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried woman and the virgin are anxious about the affairs of the Lord, so they may be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about the affairs of the world, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to put any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and unhindered devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he's not behaving properly toward his fiancée, if his passions are strong, and so it has to be, let him marry as he wishes. It's no sin. Let them marry. But if someone stands firm in his resolve, being under no necessity, but having his own desire under control, and is determined in his own mind to keep her as his fiancée, he will do well. So then, He who marries his fiancée does well, and he who refrains from marrying will do better. Okay. All right. Let's see what Dr. Hayes makes of all that. So Paul takes up another point from the letter he's received from Corinth. Now concerning virgins, he says. The virgins are young women who are betrothed, promised, but not yet married to men in the church. Paul's answer to this question is completely consistent with the pattern we've seen in all the other cases in this chapter. It is better for them to remain as they are, in this case, unmarried. But if they choose to marry, that's no sin. He who marries his fiancée, literally virgin, does well. And he who refrains from marriage does better. The decision is presented as the man's unilateral decision. This is one place where the careful symmetry of his treatment breaks down. Uh, He makes this the man's decision, not the woman's. Why should the unmarried remain unmarried? Paul believes the present order of the world is going to pass away in the very near future, and marriage presents many distractions that may hinder service to the Lord. So in verse 29 he says, The appointed time has grown short. Paul expects the return of the Lord and the judgment of the world in the very near future. As he said in Romans 13 that we read recently, salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Because the time is foreshortened, ordinary temporal matters dwindle in significance. Or to speak more precisely, assume the significance that is properly theirs in the light of God's coming judgment. That is why Christians should live as if the end were at hand not investing themselves inappropriately in issues and affairs that belong to the old age when the new age is so close now upon us. The present order of things is not ultimate. Similarly, Paul cannot be telling the Corinthians not to mourn and not to rejoice. Rather, he means that even in the midst of mourning something or rejoicing something, 
they must still recognize the day is coming when God will wipe away all tears and joy will be complete for everyone. Christians should live as people who know that all these things have at best some penultimate significance, knowing that we can take whatever may come with equanimity because the end is very close now. The present necessity to which he refers in verse 26 is the urgent imperative. That is, we've got to take care of the most important things, and that means for him proclaiming the gospel and doing the work of the Lord in the short time that remains. It explains more clearly why Paul regards celibacy as preferable to marriage. It frees the time and attention and energy of believers for the crucial work that is to be done in the precious short time before the perusia. Now, you've heard that word before, but uh, let me just give it to you again here. Perusia is the end time, okay? Uh, the coming again. Okay, everybody happy? Let's read on. Verse 39. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if the husband dies, she's free to marry anyone she wishes, only in the Lord. But in my judgment, she's more blessed if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. So this brief final section adds nothing really new to the counsel that Paul has already given. Paul has offered here a vision of marriage as a relationship in which the partners are bonded together in submission to one another, each committed to meeting the other's needs. In the ancient world, this vision posed a challenge to the patriarchal picture of the husband as master of his wife. One very strange development in the history of Christian doctrine is the Roman Catholic Church's later espousal of the non-biblical idea that the purpose of marital intercourse is primarily for procreation. Now, here is a Methodist theologian who's taking on the Roman Catholic Church at this point. That is, the idea that sex is only for making babies. He says nothing could be further from Paul's view. He never mentions having babies at all, but he argues strongly that partners in marriage should satisfy one's sexual desires and needs. This approach takes very seriously the reality and power of the human sexual drive. One of the most important messages of this text is that the single life has dignity and value before God if people choose to remain single. For many people, it is better to remain unmarried because the single life allows Christians the freedom and flexibility to serve God without any distraction. Any question? All your questions about sex have been answered. We can move on now to, do you eat meat offered to idols? Let's go to chapter 8. <clears throat> Let me give you a little, a few sentences here of introduction before we get into the reading. Paul now takes up another issue from the Corinthians letter to him. The problem of food that has been prior sacrificed to idols. There was some controversy among the Corinthian Christians whether it was permissible to eat meat from animals used in pagan sacrifices. Paul does not render a simple judgment. Instead, he launches into a long and complex argument as was his bent. Paul seems to hold that idle meat is actually harmless, while nonetheless encouraging the enlightened to abstain for the sake, for the sake of other people's scruples. He is primarily addressing the problem of sacrificial food consumed in the temple of the pagan god. The very fact that Paul crafts such an elaborate argument concerning idol meat shows that it was a major issue in the church at Corinth. Idol meat was a hot-button issue in Corinth because it dramatized three much larger concerns. Number one, the problem of boundaries between the church and the pagan culture that surrounded it. Two, the strained relationship between different social classes in the community. And three, the relation between knowledge and love as the foundation of the church's life. Let's take a look and you'll understand. Chapter 8. Uh, let's read the whole chapter and deal with it at, at one time. Now concerning food sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. 
If you're reading along with me, you'll see that those words are in quotation marks. The reason they are is that he's quoting from their own letter. Uh, they've told him, all of us possess knowledge, so he's acknowledging that that's how they feel. All of us possess knowledge. But he adds, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Notice again, he has both of those ideas in quotation marks. He's quoting from their letter. They've said, um, these idols really aren't real. We know there are no other gods but one now, because that's what you've told us, Paul. So whatever these people think they're doing and offering up meat to some other god, there is no other god. So what's the problem here? Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, they may not be the right one, may not be the real one, but people have them, he's saying. Yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. Notice that's in quotation marks. That's what they've told him in their argument. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, that is, you know there's only one God, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Um, I don't know how to dramatically help you understand how prevalent this offering of meat to idols was. But the sacrificial system existed worldwide. Uh, I think people sometimes have the idea that only the Jews did animal sacrifice or maybe those in the Middle East. We know now that people sacrificed things of value to them all over the planet. National Geographic has routed out these uh, various victims of sacrifice. In the peat bogs of northern England, part of Scotland, Ireland, they have found skeletal remains and the way the body is bound and so forth, they are convinced this was a sacrifice to the gods. Down in South America, uh, in the Incas, they've discovered bodies high up in the Andes that were definitely offered up as human sacrifice. They were given some mild uh, sedative, as they knew from the herbs and so on they had, to sort of protect the people from suffering at the last moment. But they were sacrifices. We know the Aztecs and others offered up sacrifice. And if what they were sacrificing, usually the finest little animal they had without blemish and spot, the one they loved the most, if that didn't bring about change in the weather or whatever they were trying to effect in change, then they offered up their children or somebody else's children. They offered up human sacrifice. Now, those of you who traveled extensively in other parts of the world uh, have seen evidence of this. I remember once we were on the island of uh, Sicily, uh, from which Gail's uh, uh, paternal grandmother grandfather came. And uh, there's still beautiful ruins of ancient temples up on the tops of hills in Sicily. Sicily's sort of like Poland. They've been overrun and overrun and overrun through the centuries. Uh, if there was a stronger power to the east, they first overran Sicily. If there was a strong power from the west, they first overran Sicily. So they've, they've been influenced by all these migrations of conquerors across their island. And so the Greeks, uh, at one time under Alexander the Great, conquered Sicily, and they built these magnificent temples to pagan gods. Later, when the Christians under Constantine you know, assumed power, they overran Sicily. And 
took the guts out of those temples, if you would, and made them into Christian temples. Same thing the Muslims did in Istanbul, for example, who had one of the most beautiful Christian churches in the world in ancient Constantinople. And once the Muslims took it over, they painted out all the Christian signs and symbols and, and, and painted over that with, with the Muslim symbols and so on. So it's been done all over the world. But uh, there is a place at Syracuse in, in Sicily where they take you to a big outdoor amphitheater and point out to you that on this spot, uh, one of their rulers who was trying to win the favor of all the people, or as many as he could, uh, sacrificed at one time more than 4,000 cows. You know, animals, more than 4,000 at one time. You know, once they had, you know, properly sacrificed and the blood had been spilled and so on, then they had a big barbecue. So it wasn't that all this meat went to waste, as it were. Even in Jewish sacrifice, often it says the fat parts that send a, a billow of smoke up, and that smoke reaches the nostrils of God, and he sees it's a, it's a pleasant smell that people are willing to offer up the best they have to him. And then you get to take the meat home and eat it with your family. Priests got a certain portion because that's the way they were, they were supported and so on. So that's the problem. There are temples, were temples everywhere in Corinth, and this God and that God had sacrifice being made to them. We also know that these ancient cults usually centered in fertility. And I've told you that any number of times. They centered in fertility. Um, in that ancient world where so many young women died in childbirth and so on, if not, uh, they could have appendicitis and die. You could have any number of things and just die. So every woman needed to have babies if she could. And every you they needed to have lambs and every cow to have calves and Every seed they planted, they needed to germinate and produce more food, beans, peas, whatever. So these old cults, usually centered in gods and goddesses of fertility, and they mix these religions up. Uh, when those of you who've been to the, the fountains and gardens of Tivoli in Italy, will recall that these magnificent gardens and fountains were built for an archbishop. The one to be Pope didn't get elected Pope, so the one who did get elected banished him to this little nowhere place called Tivoli. And uh, since his family had a lot of money, uh, they built him whatever he wanted and channeled uh, water from a nearby river, uh, put the gardens down lower so that gravity would force the water up through his fountains and so on. But right here in the gardens of an archbishop of the church, you have the Greek gods and goddesses of fertility and the Roman gods and goddesses of fertility, including the woman with you know, 16 breasts on her chest. Gods and goddesses of fertility. And they got them all mixed up. You know, got them all mixed up. So that's what Paul's concern is here. And he's trying to address that concern about the meat offered to idols. Eat it or don't eat it. All right, let's see what Dr. Hayes makes of this. As in the last chapter, Paul introduces this topic with a brief quotation from the letter he had received. The Corinthians had said, all of us possess knowledge. Paul said, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. The presenting problem is a conflict in Corinth. Are Christians free to eat meat from animals slaughtered in pagan cultic rituals? Paul's discussion of the problem suggests that the issue had arisen particularly because some Corinthian Christians were attending the feasts held in pagan temples where meat was served to everyone present. Their justification for this practice may be reconstructed from Paul's remarks here. As enlightened Christians, they possess knowledge that there is only one God and that pagan idols are nothing other than lifeless statues, having no power to help or harm anybody. Furthermore, they also have the knowledge that food is spiritually, spiritually insignificant. The dietary laws of the Jews are not, are not forced upon these Gentiles. They don't have to eat kosher. So just as Gentiles need not seek God's approval by keeping Jewish dietary laws, so also they need not worry about the source of the meat they eat, since whatever God to whom it was offered isn't real at all. It's just a piece of rock or a carving of wood. So eat. That's what some had decided. The Corinthian letter probably appealed to Paul to set the record straight by encouraging the weak to overcome their qualms and enter the world of spiritual freedom. Now, feasts held in temples were common events in the daily life of a Greco-Roman city like Corinth. 
the wealthier Corinthians would have been invited to meals in such places as a regular part of their social life to celebrate birthdays, weddings, healings attributed to whatever God was being honored in a particular temple or some other important occasion. For those few Corinthian Christians who were among the wealthier class, and Paul's already reminded that most of them were not of that class, their public and professional duties virtually required the networking that occurred through attending and sponsoring such events. To eat the sacrificial meat served on such occasions was simple social courtesy. To refuse to share in the meal would be an affront to the host. Within the social circle of the poorer Corinthians, on the other hand, such meat eating would not have been commonplace. Poor people rarely had meat in their diets. Any of you remember being poor enough that was the case? I remember being poor enough that was the case. And when in the fall of the year it would get cold enough to kill the fatted hog, what a feast it was. Every part of the animal was used, not all eaten, of course, on the day it was slaughtered, but sausages were made and smoked to get all the way through the winter. Uh, fat was cooked down to make cooking lard from that point. Every part of the animal was used. I remember my grandfather Hightower, and that was the, my dad's side was poor enough, my mother's side poorer yet. And uh, when, you know, right at the end of the war, when I was still a little boy, uh, my grandfather Hightower, my mother's dad, would show me how to poke cornbread into the backbone to push the marrow out the other side. And that fat was so wonderful when you'd had none for weeks and weeks, maybe even months. The poor people didn't have much meat in their diet. Within the social circle of the poor Corinthians, this was a big question. If we're ever offered any meat, can we eat it or not? Consequently, the wealthy and powerful, who also had the most education, would take the eating of meat in stride and readily accept the view that it was a matter of spiritual indifference. At the same time, however, the poor might regard meat as laden with numinous religious connotations. Thus, the distinction between the weak and those with knowledge may have fallen, at least to some extent, along socioeconomic lines. Is Paul going to side with the rich and powerful or with the weak and poor? Paul seizes the occasion to challenge those with knowledge to reconsider their actions on the basis of very different standards. He immediately suggests that knowledge is defective if it fails to build up the community of believers in love. The cause of this prideful puffing up is stated explicitly for the first time. Knowledge can lead to arrogance. Those in the know could feel superior to others who lacked their privileged perspective. In fact, they could imagine themselves as being saved through their own intellectual and spiritual capacities rather than by God's grace alone. Paul insists that what really matters is love, which builds up the community. That anything that tears apart the community of faith is bad. And anything that builds it up and makes it stronger is good. The one who knows rightly will love the brothers and sisters in the community of faith. The initiative in salvation comes from God, not from us. It is God who loves first, God who elects us and delivers us from the power of sin and death. Therefore, what counts is not so much our knowledge of God as God's knowledge of us. I've told you this before, I know, numbers of times, but... I think of it often. Dr. Charles Allen used to say, my mentor at First Methodist Houston, some people say it's not what you know, it's who you know. But I tell you, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Who knows you? And in this case, Dr. Hayes says, the one who knows you is God. And that's the most important thing. Anyone who understands that the logic of the gospel depends on God's initiative will not become puffed up by the possession of knowledge. Paul insists on the priority of love over knowledge. 
Again, he quotes slogans from the Corinthian letter. No idol in the world really exists and there is no God but one. These slogans express a perspective with which Paul does not disagree. I mean, he knows there's only one true God and these others really are, are fakes. His quarrel is with the Corinthians' application of their slogans. There are many so-called gods. Anyone who walked through the city of Corinth and observed the shrines and statues to those gods could hardly avoid recognizing that, in fact, there are many gods. Real or not, there are gods. So Paul's use of the dismissive adjective so-called gods shows that he does not believe these figures to be real gods except in the minds of those who worship them. But in their minds, they're real. Paul deftly prepares the way for the two-part confessional formula of verse 6, which contrasts the many gods and lords to the one God and one Lord whom Christians have come to worship. We should hear in this confession a significant echo of the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6, the great proclamation of Israel's faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, that's the I am who I am, our Elohim, is one. The early Christian confession cited in verse 6 takes the extraordinarily bold step of identifying the Lord Jesus with the Lord acclaimed in the Jewish Shema, while still insisting that for us there is one God. Paul and other early Christians have reshaped Israel's faith in such a way that Jesus is now acclaimed as Lord within the framework of monotheism. For centuries there were Jews who said we were not monotheistic, we Christians, that we had three gods. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were three different gods. Uh, those who are in serious dialogue with us now are willing to acknowledge that we're talking about one God who has revealed himself three ways. But that was not always the case. Why then does Paul quote this confessional statement? First of all, he is establishing firm common ground with his readers. Christian thought begins from a confession that binds us specifically to the one God of Israel. Uh, this God of Israel is a jealous God who is well known to have no tolerance for idolatry. So first he poses a challenge to the premise of the Corinthian slogan that we all possess knowledge. In fact, he insists not everyone in the community does share this knowledge. Some members of the fledgling church are so accustomed to thinking of the idols as real that they cannot eat the idol meat without conjuring up the whole symbolic world of idol worship. They are dragged back into that world and so by it defiled. This shows, by the way, that the weak about whom Paul writes here are not Jewish Christians. Jewish Christians would not have been dragged back into the world of idolatry. It's the Gentiles to whom he's writing. They're the ones who have been accustomed to idols, not Jews. He says, take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. This word for liberty is a loaded word which will become a major theme in the next chapter 9. The ordinary meaning of the word in Greek is authority. It is related to the verb existen that appeared in the Corinthian slogan, I'm free to do anything. Those Corinthians who eat idol meat claim to do so by virtue of their own sovereign liberty. Their philosophically formed strength of character. Paul somewhat wryly warns that those who seek to flex their spiritual muscles in this way should watch out to see what effect it will have on others around them. The weak will see these who boast of such knowledge eating in the temple of an idol and be influenced. They will come to the wrong conclusion. This is a very important statement because it shows that Paul's primary concern here is not whether they eat the meat in the marketplace or not. Rather, he's worried about having weak Christians, Gentiles, drawn back into the temple, into the powerful world of the pagan cult which was, we must always remember, the dominant symbolic world in which these Corinthian Christians lived. It's the way life was lived in Corinth. In verse 11, Paul states the dire consequences of such cultural compromise. The weak will be destroyed by this. This language should not be watered down. The concern is not that the weak will be offended 
by the actions of these who claim to have so much knowledge. Paul's concern is that they will become alienated from Christ Jesus and fall away from the sphere of God's saving power, being sucked back into their former way of life. So Paul presents this horrifying possibility with biting irony. He says, so the weak one is destroyed by your knowledge, the brother for whom Christ died. Christ died for this person, and you can't even change your diet. On one side, we have the Son of God who died for us while we were still weak. And on the other side, we have these knowledge flexors who are so fixated on exercising their own freedom, they're willing to trample on the weak and jeopardize their very salvation. So, Paul concludes this unit by declaring his own resolution in this matter. Therefore, he says, If food should cause my brother or sister to fall, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause my brother or sister to fall. Interestingly, the word meat in this sentence is a Greek generic word for animal flesh, not the specific term idle meat that was occurring previously in the same chapter. Paul is willing to forego not only the specific practice of eating idle food, but also the eating of meat altogether, if that is necessary, to protect the weak from stumbling. Thus, this chapter 8 must be read as a compelling invitation to the strong Corinthians to come over and join Paul at the table with the weak. This invitation is far more urgent than any invitation to savor meat with their rich friends in the respectable world of Corinthian society. Okay. I think we're done with that. Ready to go? Yes, sir. Ma'am, I mean, sorry. The, the, uh, the, the description of the Trinity as such doesn't really uh, get done well until the Council of Nicaea in 325, not in Paul's lifetime. Uh, so Paul would not have uh, you know, said in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is saying that he believes... Israel's God is God, uh, has chosen to reveal himself in a particular once and for all way, Jesus of Nazareth. And that therefore, the very stuff, um, essence is the word that comes from Latin, uh, once, once the Romans bought into this Christian faith, they used the word essence. Uh, the very essence of the Almighty was placed into Mary's child. Jesus was not all of God, for sure. In his humanity, he prayed to God, sought guidance, direction, and strength from God. Uh, so, Paul always in his writing has people not becoming Jesus people, but becoming God people through what they've learned about God in Jesus Christ. Um, there's a passage in Philippians we haven't come to yet that says, though Jesus could have counted equality with God a thing to be grasped, he did not. He emptied himself, taking on the role of a servant, doulos, can mean servant or slave, a servant or slave, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus, the name of a flesh and blood person, Christ, equating him with the long-awaited Messiah, Jesus Messiah, is Lord, 
And that's the name that translates the name given at the burning bush, the I am who I am. But a lot of Christians stop the verse at that point, and it doesn't stop at that point. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, this became a major point of contention from the time of the Nicene Council and, and following. When the Greeks and the Romans fought, they fought over what they called the filioque clause. I, I think I've told you this. Uh, I've been with you such a long time now. I can't always remember just what I've told you, what I haven't, and what, into what group. But when I was moderating a call-in radio show uh, down in Houston, seven years, uh, I would preach on Sunday nights at First Methodist Church and rush Gale and the children to the parsonage to be sure they were safely inside and locked in. And I would go to KXYZ Radio, a big 50,000-watt station there owned by ABC Network. It was called KXYZ Radio. And they had asked me if I, told me if I would give my time, they would give the air time. And we would call this program Religion on the Line, a telephone line, live telephone line, but also on the line. People could ask anything they wanted to. Religion would defend itself, if you would, against anything else. So I could do the show by myself or I could have guests on. And, and there were nights when I went down by myself and there were other times, more of them, when I had somebody else there, a Jewish rabbi. So, Well, one of my favorite people uh, whom I invited periodically was the Greek Orthodox priest named Father Nicholas Triantafilu. He is now back in Boston, his hometown, and uh, president of the Greek Orthodox Seminary there now. But he was head of the cathedral church uh, in his late 20s there. Very, very capable young man. And when Father Nick was on with me, the very first night, a caller, and of course Houston's a huge metropolitan area, I had no idea who these callers were, but some person asked, what's the difference between you and a Roman Catholic priest? And his immediate response was the filioque clause. And he started up about the filioque clause. And he'd gone into it two or three minutes. And I said, Father, Father, this person doesn't have a clue what you're talking about. Uh, he wants to know, do you have a wife or are you celibate like a Roman, you know, and so on. And he smiled and said, oh. And so he, well, yes, I have a wife and we have three children and so on. Um, so that was what they were talking about. But to a Greek Orthodox priest, first thing that comes to mind, the big difference between us and Roman Catholics, the filioque clause. One holds that the Holy Spirit came only from God. God put a part of himself in Mary's child Jesus and God sent the Holy Spirit. And the other says, no, the Holy Spirit for him came from God the Father and the Son. Uh, Philios is, is, is son, or brotherly in this case. So, so uh, whether the Holy Spirit came from just God or from God and the Holy Spirit, that's, they fought about it for over a thousand years. They fought about this question. And uh, there was a question at the Disciple Bible luncheon uh, two weeks ago when, when Dr. Northcutt was here and she showed it to me and she said, does anybody here really care about that? And I said, well, you and I don't, so forget it and go on to something else. Uh, no, the average Christian isn't concerned about did the Holy Spirit come from God or from God and the Son? Um, it was a time before these, were, these three were seen uh, as somehow manifestations of God. But we United Methodists who went to United Methodist seminaries and got taught the way United Methodists are supposed to believe understand that we are theologically centered, Christologically revealed. Meaning, we are God-centered, but we've come to understand God most clearly in Jesus Christ. So, Paul, I believe we are consistent with Paul's teaching here. Paul sees God as supreme and one. God is one. Uh, God has chosen to reveal himself to us in a flesh and blood person. Mary's child Jesus. 
And so a part of the Almighty, but not all of the Almighty, was placed in Jesus. What was there was the real stuff. We can see Jesus Christ if we really see him. But I was reporting to our staff a couple of weeks ago something that a couple of pastors here in Tulsa had had to say about our relationship with Jews and Muslims. And when I told them what these two pastors had said, Dr. Kroll said, then they don't know Jesus. He's talking about Christian ministers in our community. I won't be more specific than that right now. But two Christian ministers in our community, and Dr. Kroll said, then they don't know Jesus. If what they have said, you know, they would not allow uh, one of our rabbi friends to offer a prayer in their building, would not allow Rabbi Sherman to offer a prayer in their building. Bill said, they don't know Jesus. They don't know him. So, God is revealed most clearly for us in Christ Jesus. But Jesus always pointed the way to God. Okay. Okay. Dealing with the Trinity is very complicated, very difficult, but, you know, essential. Okay, let's go to chapter 9 here. We've got, uh, we're going to do the whole thing. <coughs> Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Remember, he didn't see him in flesh and blood. He saw the resurrected one on the road to Damascus. Are you not my work in the Lord? If I'm not an apostle to others, at least I am to you. See, the first 12 didn't acknowledge Paul as being on equal standing with them. But he thinks he has equal standing to them. He's just been delegated to take his gospel to the, to the Gentiles. If I'm not an apostle apostle to others, to some who don't see me as such, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to our food and drink? Do we not have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Remember, Cephas is the Aramaic name for Peter. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? who at any time pays the expenses for doing military service, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not get any of its milk. Do I say this on human authority? Does not the law also say the same? By law he means Torah. For it is written in the Torah of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned, or does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was indeed written for our sake, for whoever plows shall plow in hope, and whoever threshes shall thresh in hope of a share in the crop. If we have sown spiritual good among you, is it too much if we reap your material benefits? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we still more? Nevertheless, we've not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is sacrificed on the altar? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I've made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing this so that they may be applied in my case. Indeed, I would rather die than that. No one would deprive me of my ground for boasting. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward, but if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel." For though I'm free with respect to all, I've made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the Torah, I became as one under the Torah, though I myself am not under the Torah, so that I might win those under the Torah. To those outside the Torah, I became as one outside the Torah, though I am not free from God's Torah, but am under Christ's Torah, so that I might win those outside the Torah. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. 
Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air, but I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. Okay. In chapter 8, Paul calls upon the strong at Corinth to limit their freedom for the sake of the weak. He points to himself as as an example. He will never eat meat if it would cause a brother and sister to, to stumble. Paul's practice of supporting himself by working as a tent maker has suggested a disturbing conclusion to the Corinthians. Perhaps Paul is not really a legitimate apostle at all. If he were legitimate, surely he would act in ways more dignified than stitching tents together. However, working for a living preserved the philosopher's independence from control by any other people. In verses 1 through 14 we've just read, he argues that he's a real apostle and therefore has every right to receive financial support from the Corinthians. And then in the verses that follow, he explains that he's renounced those legitimate rights by offering the gospel free of charge and identifying with lower status members of the community. The Corinthian existence as a Christian community is dependent upon Paul's work in their midst. There would be no church if it were not for Paul. That is the sense in which the Corinthian church itself is a seal of Paul's apostleship. The Corinthian letter has indicated that they are in fact passing judgment now upon him. This recalls an earlier statement in the letter using the same verb. But with me it is a small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In chapter 9, the points in dispute seem to be related to his lifestyle and his means of self-support. In principle, Paul has the right to eat what he wants, to be accompanied by a wife like the other apostles if he should choose, to be supported financially by the churches that he has founded. Yet as the Corinthians already know, he does not do any of these things. The fact that Paul chooses not to do these things does not mean that he lacks the authority to do them. The reference to the wives of the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord, he means Jesus' own flesh and blood brothers, including James, who became head of the church in Jerusalem, and Cephas, shows that the apostles and other early Christian leaders were normally married, a fact that surely causes some embarrassment to those Christian traditions that later came to insist upon clerical celibacy. The brothers of the Lord refers to the natural siblings of Jesus, James, the brother of the Lord, particularly emerged as a prominent figure in the Jerusalem church. In verse 7, he asked, Don't soldiers and vine growers and shepherds all get their livelihood from their work? Likewise, it is implied proclaimers of the word should be sustained by their own flock of followers. Even the Torah supports Paul's case that he has a right to be financially sustained by the church. He cites Deuteronomy chapter 25, You shall not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. The ox being driven around and around the threshing floor should not be cruelly restrained from eating the food that his own labor is making available. Paul believes that accepting financial support from the Corinthians would create barriers for his work of proclamation. Since that is his preeminent concern, proclaiming the gospel, he will take no money from them. The argument could end there, but Paul doubles back and adduces still two more arguments warranting his right to receive support. Verse 13, the analogy of the priest in the temple who get a share of the sacrificial meat to take home to their families. And finally, the trump card of the whole argument, Jesus himself commanded that proclaimers of the gospel should get their living by the gospel. He probably has in mind the commissioning of the 70 to proclaim the kingdom of God, Matthew chapter 10, and saying, the laborer is worthy of his wages. Paul will take no money because he cannot claim to be working voluntarily as an apostle. His service is rendered to God, not willingly, but because he's been entrusted with a commission, he says. The language here suggests once again the image of the slave. Paul preaches because of necessity. It's been laid upon him by God. We might recall the image of Jeremiah, for whom the prophetic word is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. He has no choice but to proclaim the gospel. I heard an older preacher say one time, don't ever be a preacher if God will let you do anything else.
Everything that Paul does is aimed at winning as many people as possible to the gospel. He will adapt his behavior, but not his message, in whatever way necessary to achieve that end. Paul represents himself here as a conciliator, seeking to overcome cultural and ethnic divisions in order to bring people of all sorts into the one community of faith. In order to do this, he's made himself a free man. He's made himself a slave to all. Notice that this is exactly what Paul had said happens to free persons. When they are called, they become slaves of Christ. Paul gives four examples of his adaptive behavior, verses 20, 21, 22. To Jews, he became as a Jew. The second example may be nothing other than a restatement of the first, though it is sometimes suggested that this formulation might include the slightly wider circle of Gentile God-fearers, not just Jews. The third example, verse 21, refers clearly to Paul's ministry to Gentiles, his fundamental apostolic mission. Paul not only resisted the imposition of Jewish Torah on Gentiles, but also himself adopted a casual attitude toward Torah observance. He's quit eating kosher as far as we can tell here. Being free from the Torah does not mean that Paul runs wild with self-indulgence. Instead, he lives with a powerful sense of obligation to God, defined now by his relationship to Christ. Christ's self-sacrificial death on a cross has now become the normative pattern for Paul's own existence. The fourth, he says, to the weak I became weak so that I might win the weak. He does not say I became as the weak, but rather I became weak. Paul actually took on the lifestyle and conditions of the poor. He accepted for himself their strictures against eating idle meat, and he lowered himself to the social status of the weak by refusing the patronage of the rich and becoming a manual laborer stitching together tents. While these actions may have seemed puzzling and even demeaning to the stronger, higher-class Corinthians, this self-lowering, he believed, lowering of self, was in keeping with the teachings of Jesus. In Galatians, which we haven't come to yet, we will hear him say, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. And he says they're to be like athletes in training to win the race. Unlike some of Paul's other metaphors, this one requires little explanation for readers today who know well the sacrifices and discipline required of athletes. Paul's use of this imagery is inspired by the Isthmian Games. It's hard to say. The Isthmus of, of Corinth here. Uh, as there were other games in other parts of Greece, there were games here on the Isthmus itself. And the people in Corinth would have been very familiar, like our Olympics today. They would know exactly what he's talking about. Uh, Paul's use of this imagery is inspired by the Isthmian Games, the great athletic festival held at Corinth every two years. The Corinthians would find Paul's depictions of the runner and the boxer familiar, vivid, and compelling. His references to the athlete's perishable wreath, Paul is saying if these athletes push themselves to the limit in training to win that pathetic crown of withered vegetables, how much more should we maintain self-discipline for the sake of an imperishable crown in the kingdom of God? The self-control to which Paul is calling the strong is precisely the discipline of giving up their privileges for the sake of others in the community. While Paul speaks of punishing and enslaving his body in order to avoid being disqualified, the interpreter may need to explain that the body here is not the enemy of the spiritual. Rather, it is the instrument of that life. The athletic metaphor continues to govern the sense of verse 27. The punishment of the body refers to grueling training for the contest, pushing oneself almost to the breaking point, seeking to bring the body to peak efficiency. To enslave the body means, in this context, to devote it unreservedly to, er, unreservedly to God's service through service to others, not to practice self-denial for its own sake. Okay, just one second more. Several years ago, when the Duke University men's basketball team, remember Dr. Hayes is on faculty at Duke, 
When the Duke University men's basketball team won back-to-back national championships, there was a popular t-shirt on campus. The front read, you can talk the game, but can you play the game? And on the back, above the school logo, in large letters was printed the slogan, we can play. That's the challenge Paul poses to his readers. Can you play this game to which God has recruited you? We are called to pay the price of sacrifice and discipline in order to play the game rightly and thus to win the prize. Uh, One of my favorite Bobby Knight quotes is, Bobby Knight always says, people talk about the will to win. The will to win. And he said, everybody has the will to win. The question is, do you have the will to prepare to win? And that's a different question. All right. If you haven't been to church, don't rush off. I'll be right back. <laughs>